All right, question number one is from Andrew, who says, you wrote a post back in 2011 about a mission-directed closed-loop research system. I'm curious, do you still use this system? Well, Andrew, I think a, a clue to what my answer is going to be is the fact that I had to go and look up this post you referenced to see what is this mission-directed closed-looped research system of which you speak. I put a link to this article in the description of this episode so you can load it up if you want to read along. So this article, I have it in front of me here. This article I wrote on my birthday in 2011. And I write about the research system I put together because, and I'm quoting the article now, now that I'm a month away from starting my new position at Georgetown, I've arrived at a relatively stable research strategy. I assume it will evolve as I gain more experience as a professor, and I'm somewhat nervous that the more experienced among you will scoff at my naivete, but it's just starting point, a way to start my new position with a proactive, not reactive mindset. So this post was describing the research system I had put together in preparation for becoming a professor. I'm gonna actually read some details of this, and then I'll tell you how I think about it now, looking at it through hindsight. So in this post, I talk about this research system as levels, the bottom level up to the middle level, to the top level and I even have a handy diagram I drew. So here's how I talk about the bottom level of this research system in my 2011 post. At the bottom level is background research. Every week I try to learn something new about my field. I either read a paper, attend a talk, or schedule a meeting to ensure that I'm really understanding the new idea. I require myself to add a summary in my own words to a growing document that I call my research Bible. There's a screenshot in this post of the table of contents of my research Bible. It's a law tech document, LaTeX tech document, and it has all sorts of different topics in it of where I'm collecting notes and all sorts of different things I'm thinking about. All right, middle level of this research system. I'm quoting now from the article again. My background reading and brainstorming generates concrete projects. Borrowing a nice concept from Peter Sims, I call these projects little bets. Each little bet has the following characteristics. All right, and I list some characteristics. I try to keep only two or three of these bets active at a time, and I attack them aggressively, tracking my hours using the tally I discussed in a previous post. Ooh, that might be one of the first appearances, first early appearances of my deep work tally. That's interesting. This provides a simple metric I can aim to maximize. I also force myself to be specific about my timing for these little bets as I find I get better work done faster when I'm fighting to meet a specific deadline. All right, and I show a screenshot of a Google Doc where I have these active... Google active little bets with notes on timing. And at the top level, I'm reading from my article again, my little bets lead to publications and grants. In my recent experience, maybe one out of every three bets leads directly to something larger, but the system is too new for me to be confident. And all of this feeds into my mission. And I have a, a, a mission for my research and I use the feedback on what's working and what's not to update that mission. All right. I have a nice diagram in this article as well. So Andrew's saying, do I still use that? Uh, and the answer is no. I did not remember that system. I do remember the conference when I started coming up with those ideas. It, I, I reference in here being at, at Terminal 2 at the Zurich airport, having an espresso and, and working on these ideas in my notebook. I do remember going to that conference. This was right before I became a professor at Georgetown. I do remember presenting a paper there about Un, this unreliable network model that I had helped develop. And, and I, I have this memory of the time of it being like a neat paper that no one cared about. Like the math was pretty, the results were nice, but I invented the model and no one else was buying it. Like, great, Cal. Uh, I got to get back to working on what I want to work on. And I bet that was really the impetus for me really to get thinking harder about I need a more systematic way of tracking ideas because I need better ideas That'll lead to better publications, which will lead to a more clear research message. I mean, I just had this sense. I remember this palpably. I had this sense. I need my work to be more noteworthy. I need it to have more impact and be more interesting to work on. And I felt like I was wandering. I was smart and I had skills. You know, I had trained at the Theory of Distributed Systems Group at MIT. So I could write good papers, but they weren't getting the traction I wanted at the time. And I, and I thought a lot about how do I make my research more important? And that was the context in which I wrote and created this kind of complicated system. I don't use it anymore. And an interesting thing that I have noticed reflecting on this issue is that other professional thinkers I know, established professors, established writers, the circles that I run in, 
when they get to the higher level of these fields, they're much less likely to have any sort of organized system for making sense of potential ideas to work on. They're unlikely to have systems like my research Bible here where they can systematically collect information so they don't forget it. They're unlikely to have some sort of Zettelkasten style setup where connections will be surfaced through the mechanisms of the system itself that will bring to their attention new insights they never had before. This miserly hoarding of potential insight that could be evolved into value into the world at some point is something that becomes increasingly rare, at least in my experience, as people move up the ranks of professional idea creation. And this is what I've learned through my own experience. Ideas are easy, writing is hard. Having a good idea is not the hard part. It's not the crux, the bottleneck that prevents professional I, uh, idea type people, writers, professors from succeeding. It's taking an idea with potential and realizing that potential. That is really difficult. Here's the typical, I'm just reflecting on my own experience here, but here's the typical tempo in recent years for me when it comes to professional idea work. There's always a stream of ideas coming by me. A lot of them are bad. Some of them are interesting. Some are good. Every once in a while you get that JK Rowling on the train having the idea to write a story about a boy discovering he's a wizard type moment. Not that often, but sometimes you have those ideas. And that's pretty exciting. Deep work was maybe like that for me. But these ideas are sort of coming by all the time. There's plenty of ideas. The more you read, the more you're exposed, the more you create ideas for a living, the more your brain is good at becoming a pattern recognition machine tuned to the particular pattern of potentially good ideas. Now, once you're ready to do you're ready to do something. You finished a book, an article, a paper, you're looking for something new. You just grab one of these high potential ideas. Uh, how about this one? It's not as random as I'm making that out. I mean, your mind, again, at this point is a good pattern matching machine. So it's pretty good at saying this idea has got potential. It's a more subtle decision than you think, but you grab one. And then all the effort goes into how do we actually turn this into something good? And that's really, really hard. And now you have the research. So when you think about professional writers or professors with very detailed note-taking systems, this is not about keeping track of potential ideas. This is for trying to get their arms around the particular idea that they want to develop. It's when I'm writing a New Yorker piece and my Scrivener project for that piece grows to 250 different article notes and citations that I've captured as I try to get my arms around this particular idea. It's the long sessions of writing, the thinking, the solving proofs. Now I'm using writing here with quotation marks. I, I don't typically like writing being used too generically as a verb. If you're a professor, solving proofs is not writing. Coming up with uh, new experiments is not writing. Executing experiments is not writing. So I don't mean to be too generic on that term, but you know what I mean. It's the execution that takes that potential thought stuff and alchemizes it into something that actually has value to other minds in the world. That's really hard work. That's what where all the skill goes into. That's what determines how successful ultimately something is. And then here's the interesting thing. When you succeed, okay, I've put in all of this work and I've produced something good. And in particular, when you produce something better than you've been able to produce before, you deliberately pressed your threshold of ability higher. That pattern matching mechanism that identifies the ideas in the stream and says, this one looks good, gets better. And when you come up for air and say, what do I want to do next? The ideas that's catching the attention of your pattern matcher, they're more sophisticated, they're more nuanced, they have more potential. So in this loop, all of the effort is in executing. The ideas aren't so important. Professors at a high level aren't scared of someone scooping their ideas. You know, the hard work is actually solving it. Writers at a high level are not trying to hoard their book ideas. Ideas are cheap. Writing good books is incredibly difficult. And so this is what I've come to realize. Now, I'm sure this is not universal. I'm sure there's a lot of professional thinkers who have complicated systems for tracking potential ideas. I'm just saying it's also not universal. And I know a lot of people who don't and I don't. And the higher I move up the hierarchy of people who create ideas for a living and have some impact, the more my attention turns towards the execution and the more the coming up with the idea seems like the easy part. When it's time to come up with something, you're like, yeah, th this thing has caught my attention. I can't really ignore it. Let's do that. So anyways, those are my two cents. Uh, if we want to invent a term for this, because, hey, that's what I do, we can call this belief that the key to creative output is the careful maintenance and tracking of potential ideas. We can call this the notebook fallacy. 
Too much energy put on the organization of ideas, not enough energy put on the extraction of value from ideas. That's actually where all the action is.